here right now in this place. And uh, this is, uh, it's 2022 New Year. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll be a little spontaneous right now. Uh, can I get the music team to go to uh, What a Beautiful Name? I just, I shared this uh, story with you guys uh, probably months ago, but uh, some of you might remember when uh, I was scared at, when I'd go to my basement and I was scared, I'd just start singing uh, hymns or whatever song about Jesus that came to my mind. Um, and it just singing what a beautiful name and what we kind of prayed about before service. Um, again, I don't know everyone's situation. I do know a couple people um, that, that come to the church are struggling with stuff. Um, you guys might have kept your thing quiet and it hasn't gotten around to me. Um, but uh, not that things get around. But anyway, no, but I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, <laughs> Um, as, as an elder, as one of the one of the prayer team members, um, I, I know I know some things that are going on in people's lives, and uh, just to bring your focus this year, every day, bring your focus to Jesus. Yes, amen. That's it's so easy to get wrapped up in your own thought processes and worries and doubts. And stress about everything. But we say it, you have no rival. It's not talking about you, that's talking about you, Jesus. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. And it goes back to my story. What a powerful name. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Just saying that shakes the enemy, yeah. literally shakes the enemy, and it may not get rid of the problem, it may not get rid of the sickness, but saying the name Jesus shakes the opponent, yeah. makes them nervous, yeah. makes him nervous, worries him, yeah. pushes him back to the darkness. Yeah. Bridge two, guys. You have no rival.
Oh, so now you're going to be quiet really quick while I'm scrambling to get some things ready here. <laughs> All right. And we have a mic. All right. Praise the Lord, everybody. All right. Good to see you. Happy New Year. All right. Welcome to Lakeside. I'd like to welcome everyone who has uh, come out today. Uh, wipe the sleep from your eyes uh, because we're not over it yet, right? Like, I think I finally am caught up on my sleep, but New Year's is weird, right? So uh, we'd like to welcome those of you that are joining with us online. We are glad that you are with us. Um, we, uh, we're beginning a new year. Are you blessed in the new year? Yes. All right, if you don't believe it, then that's your declaration. That's your proclamation for what is ahead. Um, I'm excited that you're here this morning. I want to share something with you. Uh, uh, without any setup, I just want to jump right into our scripture this morning. And uh, by the way, I, I, I do feel it's important to say Kenny is afraid of the basement, was afraid of the basement when he was young. <laughs> Where'd Kenny go? Did he step out for a second? Like, he's like, remember I told you that story about being afraid of the dark and the basement or whatever? Like, if you didn't remember that story, he was a wee lad. It wasn't like last week, all right? So, um, you're welcome. You're welcome, Kenny. Um, I don't want that to be lingering in your minds while I was trying to deliver the word here this morning. Um, I just thought it was funny. I wanted to shout out right then, but... All right, so I want to look at our scripture this morning. Um, so the, the background, we're going to just take a quick look at. Most of you are familiar with the story of the children of Israel. We're in captivity in the book of Exodus and uh, in Egypt. And that God did a number of really awesome things to deliver them and to set them free. And we're not going to look at all of, the, all of the plagues and all the things that happened to Egypt and how they were, how they were judged by God Almighty. But I'm going to just take a quick look at, uh, how many of you know when I say a quick look, how many of you know what that means? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. doesn't mean anything. Um, but I want to take a look at uh, Exodus chapter 8. I know I, told, I know I told you, Patty, that we'd start in 7, but we'll just look at uh, chapter 8 and verse 1. And so here in this passage, so if you, if you know the story, and, and some of you might not, so let me just set it up. So God's people are in slavery and captivity in Egypt, and Moses has... Um, gone to Pharaoh and instructed him uh, as the Lord has instructed Moses. Thank you. That was going to get me eventually. Um, the, 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 the background noise. Um, how many of you know Jeff needs a fan when he plays, right? Right on. He's busy. Bass player, not so much. Don't, don't really need the fan. Um, but uh, Jeff, Jeff's working. Um, so, so through Moses... Um, God brings judgment on Egypt, and so there's one. And so I'm, I'm trying to tell you what you need to know, but not uh, give you the whole story, because we don't need all of it necessarily this morning. So, and how many of you know how this goes? So uh, Pharaoh goes, oh, this is awful. I don't, I'm not a fan. I don't like this. Let's, uh, all right, fine, Moses. We'll let your people go. And then when the plague stops, it was, uh, the first plague was the River Nile turned to blood. And how many of you know what happened to Pharaoh's heart after he agreed after the plague was gone, after that was over with, he changed his mind and he decided not to let God's people go. And so here we are um, with the second plague. And we just want to look at this one this morning. Uh, these are interesting um, 
most if not all of these plagues. I've heard all. I need to, I need to verify that before I tell you that all of these plagues. But um, I know that, that most of them, probably all of them, are uh, a, a rebuke of the many gods that, that Egypt worshipped. So, uh, and this, we, we'll speak about that here in just a moment, at least with this particular plague. And so, looking at verse 1, so Pharaoh changed his mind, his heart hardened, and then we'll pick up the story in, I think that's, I think I've told you all you need to know, and we'll pick up the story in verse 1 of chapter 8. The scripture tells us here, then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. And verse 2, if you refuse to let them go, I will plague your whole country with frogs. Good, good times. Good times. <laughs> the Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up from your palace and your bedroom. And check this out. I don't want to read this too quickly. And onto your bed and into, your hou- into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and your kneading trough, so where they make their food. (laughs) Verse 4, the frogs will go up on you and your people and all your officials. Um, All right, so I'll just, I'll stop right there for now and and just share with you that it's interesting, um, at least I I thought it was interesting, and maybe maybe it doesn't matter to you, but um, these plagues weren't out of, they were, they were not, extraordinary in and of themselves they were but it was the timing of them it was the the number of them it was the intensity of them in other words these plagues these kinds of things happened in Egypt Um, but so the the Nile would swell and then as it would recede you'd have all kinds of frogs they'd be all over the place Uh, particularly by the Nile they would they would uh, creep out and there was more frogs during uh, I think it was in the month of December but this would have taken place in, in August. So I don't know. I think it's interesting that God just took things that already were sort of could and did and occasionally happened there, and he just amped them up. He just revved them up. He turned them up to 11, if you know. I'll wait. I'll wait. Okay, some of you know what I mean. Some of you know what I mean by that. I mean, God just intensified things. And, and so they did have a time where, where there were more frogs than usual, but this was the wrong time. It was at Moses' command, and, um, and, the, and the, the numbers of them were beyond what was, what was normal as well. So Moses says, you know, they're, they're going to be everywhere. Uh, verse 5, then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds, and make the frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up to and the frogs came up and covered the land. And uh, verse 7, but the magicians did the same things by their sacred arts, so they also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pause for dramatic effect. So if you know the story, you know that, that Moses demonstrated God's power uh, prior to this. Uh, there, was, there were a few occasions and the occultists, the Egyptian magicians, were able to reproduce the same kind of thing that, that Moses did. And, and I guess, you know, it, it's sort of like Pharaoh saying, or, or his leaders, or his magicians, or those that practice secret arts, it's sort of like them saying, hey, we don't really care, Moses, what you do, because we can do the same kind of thing. We can do the same type of stuff. And so the magicians do the same thing, and they increase the frogs that were on the land. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to make of that, <laughs> right? Like, I wonder if Pharaoh had a moment where he scratched his head and thought, you know what would have been even cooler? If you would have made the frogs go away. That would have been, you know, I can just see God going, hmm, let's see, should we let these Egyptians... Should we let them pull this up? Yeah, fine. We'll let them do it. It'll be great. Watch this, right? So they think they're big shots. Watch what we can do. We can make our torment even worse. All right? So good times. Yeah, bravo. Uh, Verse 8. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord. So, So this is interesting. So Pharaoh summoned not his magicians. Now he's he's starting, it's starting to sink in, right? Like if we want this to go away, we better get a hold of Moses and Aaron. Like they... 
this is the guy that caused it. He's the guy that can make it go away. So you begin to see Pharaoh is beginning to have an understanding already. Like we, we asked that question, why was his heart hardened? What was God doing? And we recognize that at this point already, Pharaoh knows that Moses has the answer to this problem. In other words, Moses is beginning to recognize, if he hasn't already, that Moses' God is more powerful than, than whatever his gods and his magicians can pull off. So Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh in verse 9, I, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. And in verse 10, Pharaoh says, he gives his answer tomorrow. Pharaoh said, Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know that there is no God like Yahweh, our God. We'll take a look at verse 11 here. Uh, the frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people, and they will remain only in the Nile. Well, that's a relief. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to Yahweh about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord, Yahweh, did what Moses asked, and the frogs died in the houses and in the courtyards and in the fields. How many, how many of you know that sometimes the solution and the answer to the problem is worse than the problem? Uh, verse 14, they were piled into heaps, and the land reeked of them. Uh, but when Pharaoh saw, as most of you know, when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord God had said. So uh, we already mentioned that frogs were abundant at certain times, but, but this was an odd time of the year. They were at Moses, seemed to be at Moses' command, and they would normally stay near the Nile, but now they've invaded the houses. They're on the people. They're in their beds. So I looked up um, a, a video, and I, I, I'll show you a video. We'll show you a video here in a moment, but I didn't include this. But there was a frog infestation somewhere. I don't know if it's Florida or where it was. And there were these little tiny, little tiny frogs, and they were all over this, this patio of this, of this house. You can look it up. After the sermon, after the sermon, you can look this up. And uh, they were just everywhere. And uh, it, was a, it was a woman narrating, and, uh, and she's like, oh, my goodness, look at, look at all these frogs. And, and you could kind of see it was a, you know, it's, they're kind of off in the distance, and they're tiny. And you can kind of see some things moving around. And she's kind of giggling, and you're like, yeah, I think I see a lot of frogs. That, that is indeed unusual. And then she said, well, we caught some. And she opens a, a container. Maybe I should have included this one. She opens a container, and there's an unbelievable amount of tiny little frogs. And I mean, they're kind of, they're kind of stacked on one another. And then uh, to her credit, I mean, this lady was, was pretty, uh, uh, um, what, what would you say? I just, she was kind of tough. She, uh, it, it didn't seem to bother her that frogs are everywhere. And then the, her camera goes down and she says, look, some of them are just squished because it's unavoidable. And then she giggles. <laughs> <laughs> like, lady, you're a, you're a tough, you're a tough lady. Like, I'd be like, oh, gross, oh, it's smashed frogs. Um, ick, you know, but she said, look, see, it's just unavoidable. You can't help stepping on them. <laughs> just kind of giggles. Um, so, I mean, hats off, hats off to you, lady. Um, but, but, but so they're, I mean, imagine they're walking and they're slipping around on, on frogs and guts. And, and uh, I mean, it was uh, sure to be a, dis a disgusting thing. So as I looked at this, you know, I've heard, as I mentioned, um, that this was a uh, reputation, repudiation, repudiation of the gods of Egypt. And so I finally decided, well, I'm going to check this out for myself. And so I looked up what this god was. And so it's a god by the name of, uh, I, I'm going to pronounce it, Heket, H-E-Q-E-T, H -E -Q -E -T, he Heket. And Heket was uh, sometimes in the form of a frog, but uh, most often was in the form of a woman with a frog's head. Um, and her nostrils were said to have breathed life into the earth. And, and you, you recall I said the first plague was blood in the Nile, and they, they really worshipped the Nile. It was, in many ways, it really was the source of life for them in Egypt. And so uh, not worthy to be worshipped, but it, uh, they were indeed blessed to have the Nile there, and that was, is one of the reasons um, that, they, that they prospered as a nation. And so they have a god, Heket, 
who is a woman with a frog's head. So I looked for some examples of this, and so we've got a picture here. This is uh, some artist's depiction of he Heket, and uh, she's, a, you know, she's a, a, a lovely gal. Um, <laughs> we've got another artist's depiction. I looked for some, you know, like old stuff. That I didn't see a lot of it, and some of it, the quality was poor. Here's uh, another artist's uh, depiction of the, the goddess Heket. And now, so the next one I want to show you, I, you know, sometimes you're, you know, you're a little nervous to show things. If it's, so this is, the next one's a little racy. So I just want to warn you, um, it's an it's a artist's interpretation of Heket, and, you know, it's just an artist's interpretation. But she's, she's, uh, it's a little racy. She, Heket's kind of kind of hot in this picture, all right? I'm just going to say it. Um, so if we could just look at the, look at this picture. I'm sorry if this offends you. Smoking, right? <laughs> Smoking. I thought, should I show the picture of Hecat with her cute heels and, you know, she sh she's pretty leggy. Um, and I thought, if that causes anyone any lust problems, we'll pray for you to be delivered and cast that thing out of you because that's just plain weird. Um, if that if that <laughs> excites you, uh, yeah, she's uh, she's a beautiful gal. Uh, that's our cat. So I uh, I I kind of grabbed some video of just some you know this isn't uh, I don't know what this is, but uh, we'll show you some frogs and some infestation. So I combined something from a from a movie I've never seen. So you'll see some Egypt scenes, but but mostly what you'll see here is just um, just a, a lot of frogs infestations. I'm not sure what the what the uh, audio is going to do, so maybe be prepared to, to kill that. It, it's, uh, it might be too loud. So enjoy the disgusting... They're adorable. All right, we combined some real footage with, with some, uh, somebody had a smartphone back there in Egypt and was able to capture <laughs> some of the uh, some of the actual frog infestation. So that just gives you a, a, a hint of what they were experiencing. So, so we see things like that too in our day and age. Anybody, uh, anybody have a, like a phobia, a, a fear of frogs? Be a good idea to speak up now. Okay, all right. Um, so, so it would have been certainly, I'm not a frog fan. Like, you know, caught them when I was a kid, want nothing to do with them now, it's kind of gross. Anybody like frog legs? Frog legs, yeah, all right. Um, that's uh, good for you, I mean, good for you, but I don't know. Um, so the frogs in, in Egypt during this plague uh, were a direct result of God's judgment on Pharaoh and their gods, and he also wanted to demonstrate who he was. And so he used their own gods against them. And so as I was preparing this message, a lot of authors said, uh, several noted, like, how could you still be a big fan of Heket after this experience. Like, I don't know if they completely turned on her, but they couldn't have been thrilled with her. Like, heck, heck what, are you, what are you doing here? Are you crazy? What's going on? Um, and, and it was really God showing that he had more power than, than the Egyptian gods and, and using what they adored and worshiped and revered against them. 
In fact, uh, I also learned that, that they were, uh, frogs were not, were not killed, can you imagine? So people didn't kill frogs because they were considered to be representatives of Haket. So, you know, they're all over you, they're in your food, they're on your stuff, they're in the kitchen, and you won't do anything to them because, you know, Haket might, uh, might become cross with you, right? So, um, what a lovely, what a lovely situation. So, um, and then you saw what happened, that, that they turned, Pharaoh turned to Moses, Moses, uh, through the power of God, removed the plague of frogs, and Moses, uh, sorry, Pharaoh hardened his heart nevertheless and refused to obey what the Lord God had commanded. So the frogs in Exodus were a direct result of God's judgment, his wrath um, over Egypt and Pharaoh. But for us, frogs can represent maybe something undesirable, something that's in our way, something that is burdensome or a bother to us, something that we don't want or something that we need to get rid of or maybe not taking an important step that we need to take. So um, I don't know, I read over this quickly uh, I, I, it, was, it was difficult to do, but I read over this quickly. When Moses says, hey, Pharaoh, I leave it to you to tell me the time when you would like me to pray and ask the Lord to remove this plague of frogs. And I, I didn't want to make a big deal about it, but did it, did it stick in anyone's mind what Pharaoh's answer was? Tomorrow. Did anyone think for a moment, like, that's an odd, that's an odd response for for when you should remove the plague. Pharaoh says tomorrow. I don't know, I don't really know why he said tomorrow. So we'll see if we can illustrate this. So we'll pick on Alex here in the front. Alex, pick a number between, pick a number between one and four. Three. All right, oh, tell me what that, tell me what that says. They need to throw it at you. Tell me what that says. Why three. Why three, all right. Show, make show, get witnesses, why three. All right, why three for those of you online. Alex picked three, I said why three. Um, I just, uh, I just sort of figured Alex for a three type person. Okay. <laughs> I got skills, man. You don't know. Like you think like that was a nice sermon or whatever. I got stuff. You got no idea. I got, I'm full of baloney. That's what I got. <laughs> I, I got, I uh, got a lot of dumb lines. That's what I got. Um, why did Pharaoh say tomorrow? Remind me to tie that in if I don't get to, okay. Cause I might forget. And then it's just, it's really dumb. Um, <laughs> I thought about that. Well, one possibility might be that he's stupid, <laughs> right? Like, what a dumb thing to say. Uh, tomorrow, like, well, you know what, Moses, since you're asking, we'll get rid of him right now. Um, I doubt it was stupidity. Maybe it was. Um, how about pride? Like, I can, I can take it if you can. Moses, you're here too, right? Like, I can take it if you can. Maybe it was pride. I think we're probably getting a little closer to what it was. Stubbornness, but the same thing? I don't know. Um, but, but maybe it's, Pharaoh's just stubborn, like, oh, you're not bothering me that much, Moses, it's no big deal. Um, I don't know, I guess like, uh, tomorrow? Um, and then uh, some have noted that, that the most likely thing, because it's fun, it's fun to poke fun at Pharaoh mm -hmm. and make fun of him. I, I don't know if he's prideful or stubborn. Well, I do know he is prideful and stubborn. I do know that. I don't know how smart he was. Th if this is any indication... He's not so bright, right? If this is what we're judging that by. But others have noted that, that really what was happening is Moses was saying, all right, you pick the time, and then whatever time you pick, like, like that's, that's, when I'll pray, that's when I'll pray and I'll ask the Lord to do it. And so it's almost as though Pharaoh were, were saying, and the, kind of the agreement there, maybe it was unspoken, the agreement was, you know, Pharaoh's thinking, well, if you're asking me right now, this might be a trick. You might be tricking me into, into thinking it's right now. And maybe you know something and you're really powerless and maybe you know it's going to go away. And so you're trying to get me to say right now. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to fall into your trap, Moses. I'm going to try to try to pick a time and see if you can really pull it off. And many think that that may indeed be the reason for that. Much like I sort of anticipated um, I, I hope Alex says three, um, and I didn't give her much time, right? I darted right out, found her in the front row, didn't give her much time to think, and said, pick a number, um, and thought she might pick three. There's more to it than that, but that's all you need to know for now, <laughs> right? So, so it's possible that, that Pharaoh was trying to avoid a, 
you know, pick it. Most people will pick three. If you, if you, if you surprise them, if you don't give them time to think about it, um, I think if you don't pick three, you better watch out for that. No, they're just kind of out of the box. Um, but most people will pick if you say three to four and don't give them time to think, hmm, what's he driving at here? Let me consider the possibilities. And then you think of a number and then you, you go to something different, right? But if you don't give anybody, uh, if you don't give them much time, most people, trust me, not all people, most people, thank you, Alex. Did we plan that out ahead of time? I wish we, we should have had the camera on. I didn't, even, I didn't really look at your face. I was walking back up on the platform. I missed it. Um, was she surprised, Will? Were you, was it, I mean, a little bit? It's, it's four numbers. I mean, like, the odds are fairly good. Um, but I thought of that. I thought of that when I thought about, well, maybe that's what, you know, Moses and Pharaoh, maybe that's sort of what was going on. Like, like Pharaoh said, hmm, he wants me to pick now or maybe later, maybe later today. So I'll pick tomorrow. I don't know what the reason was. Um, but what we do know is Pharaoh and his people suffered longer than they needed to. Whether it was pride, whether it was stubbornness, whether it was stupidity, whether he and Moses were playing some kind of divine shell game, uh, you know, I don't know. But they suffered longer than they had to because Pharaoh picked tomorrow. So frauds in this story might represent uh, things in your life that you might be putting up with that you don't need to put up with any longer or you don't want to put up with any longer or you, you know that you shouldn't put up with any longer. Maybe it's, maybe it's sin or disobedience um, to God's will. Now, in, the, in this story, again, this was direct judgment from God. We're not talking about that this morning as we apply this to our lives. But, but maybe there is some disobedience or, or sin in your life that 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 frog might represent and we're putting up with it longer than we should be putting up with it we're we're waiting to do something about it maybe your frog is uh is answering god's call maybe god's called you to do something and and uh your hesitancy or maybe your fear or or could be lack of faith or any number of other reasons that might be preventing you from answering god's call maybe a frog in your life is something that is holding you back from a more fulfilling or more satisfying life. Maybe, maybe there's a frog in your life that, that might represent addiction or a bad habit or, or maybe just an annoying habit. I mean, you know, not all habits are, you know, of the devil, but they're just annoying or you just wanna, you just wanna move on or get past it or, or for whatever reason. So um, this could be a major thing. It could be, it could be less than that, but we've, got, we've all got, things in our lives and areas and places where we want to move forward and we're hesitating taking that step. And when we're challenged, we might think to ourselves, well, I'll take care of that tomorrow. I'll do it later. I'll put it off uh, for a, a future time. Uh, maybe it's a relationship that, that needs to end or a, a, a circle of friends or Folks that you need to, to, to back away from or get away from. Now, I'm not, I don't teach like some I've heard. Like if you're a Christian, just walk away from every non-Christian friend. I don't, I'm not advocating that. I don't believe in that. How are they going to come to know Christ if you abandon all of your, uh, of your non-Christian friends? Um, but sometimes there's, there's toxic people and there's people that uh, hurt you or there's people that, that uh, influence you maybe to make wrong decisions. We talked about that. Um, we talked about that a little bit last week and, and throughout the, the prior year um, that you show me the people that you're with and I'll show you what you're going to be like in, in five, or, five or ten years. So maybe there's some relationships that, you know what, it's time. I need to, I need to get away from that, that person or, or step back from that relationship. Maybe the frog in your life is just not taking that next step or, or whatever it is that, that you feel like. God's calling you to do or that you need to do. Maybe the frog in your life is fear. Maybe it's um, unforgiveness. It might be unforgiveness. Um, you're, you're not letting somebody go. You're not releasing them. Maybe the frog in your life is, is guilt. And on and on and on the list might go. Well, we've got uh, somebody asked me if I brought tobacco here this morning. Um, I said, whoops, I brought the wrong bag. Um, this is not tobacco. These are, in fact, my frogs, and these are disgusting. I, I had other little toy frogs. Hey, should we throw this and see if it lands on the 
lands on the uh, music stand. Oh, we can't, uh, we'll never repeat it. All right, so I've got some frogs here. So I asked if you're afraid of frogs. They're coming over there, you ready? Everybody paying attention? If you're, this is gonna be an underhand toss. If you're sleeping, it might be overhand. We will try not to hit the baby. We'll watch out for you. We'll watch out, we'll watch out for Anna. Becky, all right, here they come, ready? All right, you don't see that in church every day. All right, that was a terrible throw. That's why, I, that's why I'm a preacher, not an athlete. James Dobson said, actors have more testosterone than preachers. I told you that, I shouldn't have told you that, but maybe he was right, that's, that's not very cool of me. All right, let's try this again, all right. What are we gonna do? We're losing all of our frogs. All right, here they come. All right, back there, that was overhand, sorry. We got frogs coming back. Frogs, dispense of the frogs. We messed up that side. I think we got more on this side over here. Everybody needs a frog. Here comes frogs, watch out. All right, left hand, left hand was better. Here comes some, watch out, there they go. Frogs, I don't know, I counted three for you. All right, this will take a minute. All right, we're running out of frogs. I'm gonna have to, I might have to search the, search the, yeah, we get one, what happened? I missed it again, what happened? Uh, okay, so if you were here last week, I'm not gonna just throw stuff every week. That's not my new thing, all right? I know we threw, we threw papers last week. All right, um, all right, somebody wanna help me? Hey, Matt, I, there's a ton over there. Can you, yeah, throw them back. All right, here we go, where, where we want them? Right, let's go way back there, all right, some frogs. We got frogs, uh, we need the back row. Yeah. There's, uh, there's my nephew. Yako, all the way from Finland, everybody. We should... He was with us. He was with us for our Christmas palooza. I'm running out of frogs here. I know I have enough. All right, uh, coming back, coming back. They're talking in the back. Here they come. Look out, Mike. Frogs. All right, what do we need, frog? Jeffrey, you got a frog? All right, frogs. All right. There's some, there's some more laying around. Sorry. Somebody didn't get one. Matt didn't get one. Let's make sure. Matt. There's your frog there, buddy. All right. So, I had some frogs that were really kind of cute, and they were hard plastic. They would hurt more if you got hit with them, but they were less disgusting when you touched it. All right. Um, so there's your so there's your frogs. Um, I, obviously, um, I, I I hope that that is a reminder to you as we start off the new year and we're we're evaluating, we're looking at our lives and where we want to go. Uh, hopefully that will be a reminder to you. And there's other frogs laying around. If you didn't get one, thanks, Z. Z, are you going to collect the frogs and throw them around? You can collect some and we'll, we'll collect them. Don't take more than one frog if everybody doesn't have one, all right? Uh, if you need a frog, we will hook you up later. Um, we have backup frogs. Um, but I begin to think about what are some reasons why we might why we might not uh, let go of some stuff. I need to, I need to hurry this along. Um, and uh, yeah, that took, that took a lot of time. Um, and I, I came up with a number of things and I'm not gonna share with, share with you all of them. It's one of those deals, I'll, I'll sound very spiritual here and just say, you know, I felt like a couple of these were important to talk about and some of the other things, maybe, maybe not so much. So I don't have a long list and this is not an exhaustive list. There's a couple things that I wanna share with you. The first one uh, this morning is, uh, that I want to address. One of these things that might keep us from getting rid of uh, frogs. And obviously, you know, some of the frogs in our lives, we like them, we want them, we, we don't want to let them go. Um, and maybe we're in a position where, where we believe that, but we don't want to admit that. And so I want to take just a moment and talk about um, something called denial. It's interesting that we reference denial when we're talking about Egypt. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it because it's overdone, it's overused, and uh, we've all heard it, and I'm not going to say it. I'm only pointing out it's coincidental that we're talking about Egypt and the Nile, and we're talking about, talking about denial. All right. Um, so denial, it's an, that's an interesting thing. Um, I've known about it for years. We've all heard of that. I'm not going to give you definitions of denial. I might accidentally as we go anyway, but you, most of you are familiar with denial. It's, it's really lying to yourself or pretending that something in reality doesn't exist. Now, you might be here this morning and you say, you know what, that's just an excuse. I don't believe in that thing called denial. <laughs> she's quick, she's quick here on the front. That's why she's on the front row. <laughs> Do you mean to tell me that people just ignore reality and pretend like something that is an obvious fact is not an obvious fact? I don't believe it. Well, my friend, you might be in denial. Yeah, I thought maybe you'd help me. I thought maybe you'd help me with that. You might be 
in denial, I, like you, once thought to myself, you know, I know that's a thing, and I'd heard about it, and I, well, okay, I guess that's a thing that people do. And uh, I have, over the years, become more aware of how, how much of a reality and how much of a part of our lives denial often is. And so I want to just briefly share with you um, something. I'll use some big fancy words here. Um, we could talk about defense mechanisms. If I say defense mechanism, you know what that is? Um, or uh, coping skill, coping skill. So these are not, I was going to say not necessarily negative. Um, a, uh, I think, is this a good, I think this is a good definition, not a definition, but a good explanation. Um, people develop habitual modes and methods of managing stress and coping with upsetting emotions. So we all do that, right? Christians, Christians do it. You know, one of, maybe a good coping skill or a, a defense mechanism, there might be a difference. I, I'm not going to differentiate between the two. Uh, it might be getting into the word of God. That might be a healthy one. It might be prayer, right? It might be just trusting Jesus that it's all going to work out, right? That's a pretty good coping skill. Like that, I feel better when I do that. So we all develop things to help us deal with the stresses and the difficulties of life. Here's the thing. Some of those, uh, and, and I like the term uh, coping skills because they're skills. They're thing, and and uh, the experts, I guess, which I am not, would make a differentiation between something that you do consciously and something that you do unconsciously. Usually if it's conscious, um, it's a better skill. Sometimes just blowing up and screaming at people, that might be a defense mechanism or a way that you cope with stress. That one's not advisable. Come on, somebody. You with me this morning? Amen. Right? So, yeah, somebody's like, oh, yeah, got, got me. Busted. All right, people develop habitual modes and methods of managing stress and coping with upsetting emotions. By and large, these habitual methods do help people to manage and diffuse stressful situations they find themselves in, but they are not all equally efficient at the task. Amen. Some work better than others, and while some really do succeed in helping people to manage upsetting and an upsetting emotion, I think this part's uh, very important, the lesser quality methods generally end up causing more problems than they solve. Turning to Jesus, turning to prayer, you know, taking a walk, right? What, whatever. Maybe those are healthy coping skills. Um, blowing up at people, going crazy, yelling and screaming, getting in fist fights, turning to chemicals to soothe the pain. These are not good coping skills. And I think that last sentence was important, that if we don't have good coping skills, the coping skills we do have can end up making things worse. Now, how many of you think that, don't actually answer this, this is rhetorical, because that will be embarrassing and I won't know how to proceed. How many of you actually think denial is a good coping skill? Not, not ideal. Pretending that reality is not reality um, is, is not healthy. And I imagine that there's a great many people, maybe most, that sort of tuned me out when I mentioned denial. This is going to sound like a joke. It's not. It's still funny, but it's not a joke. Um, because they think, I don't, I don't have denial. Right? It's, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm not, I don't intend it to be. I, I used to hear this term denial and think, what a stupid thing. What a, that's ridiculous. Why would, you, why would you pretend reality isn't reality? And I, then I caught myself doing it. When I, was, when I was open and honest with myself, I discovered some areas where I was doing it. And I would have said, who really does is that even a real, like, who really does that? And, and so I might have been in denial about my denial, right? So, so you may have tuned me out thinking, you know, that's not something that I deal with. I, I have a feeling, and I'm no expert, but I have a feeling this is far more common than, than what we think it is. Um, Denial may be one of those things that can keep us from recognizing why I'm waiting until tomorrow to make a change in my life. Um, it can be hard for us to admit that we're doing that. Like, nobody wants to say, you know, one of my chief characteristics is denial, right? Like, we don't like to admit that. And that hurts to do it. By the way, that's one of the reasons that, we, that we're in denial, because facing the truth often hurts. But as believers, as Christians... And as churchgoers, we're challenged a lot. We come, we hear the word of God, and we're challenged a lot. 
Think about what you expose yourself to when you come to church, you hear uh, challenging messages or challenging scripture, and you're asked to lay bare your innermost being and, and look with honesty into yourself and, and, uh, uh, and, and see if there's places that, that need to change. Or but There's a lot of folks that won't do that, so congrats to you. You're part of the elite team that, that welcomes challenge and, and inward looking. Um, uh, uh, a new uh, perspective and, and looking inside. It's hard to admit if we have denial. That, that can certainly be true. But it's like the legendary comedian uh, Henny Youngman conveyed in his famous one-liner, when I read about the evils of drinking, I gave up reading altogether. Right? <laughs> so that's pretty good, right? So you've probably heard the, you've probably heard the, expression, the expression rearranging uh, deck chairs on the Titanic. So, so first of all, we have no history or understanding or knowledge that anyone actually was rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. That's a phrase that someone made up. Um, but it applies to denial. Right? It's like rearranging. It's like moving things around and pretending that the inevitable is not going to take place. And the longer we're in denial, the longer we put that thing off and, and, and kick the can down the road, um, the more immense and destructive uh, whatever that thing is that we're annoying can become, I would say uh, most often becomes worse with the passage of time, maybe every time. I only couch the phrase a little bit because I don't know if it's every time, but I say most times, probably every time. Um, someone noted this, that denial played a role in the killing of more than 1,500 of the Titanic's passengers, talking about this expression, rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. The ship's builders and operators deemed it, quote, unsinkable and launched it on the North Atlantic without enough lifeboats. Their denial worsened when it was reported, when it was reported sunk with the massive loss of life. The following morning, a vice president of the White Star Line denied reports that the Titanic had indeed sunk. He said, we place absolute confidence in the Titanic. He declared to the press, we believe the boat is unsinkable, end quote. At that very moment, at the very moment that he spoke those words, the Titanic was sitting on the ocean floor. His denial may have offered temporary consolation, but nothing more. We can, we can live in denial, but it doesn't change the reality. I want to encourage you to look inside and investigate and to, to ask yourself the tough question. Am I in denial in certain areas of my life? Is, is the frog of denial preventing me from seeing, maybe even seeing areas where I need to make a change? Okay, I'm over my time, but I've got one more. Can I just, can I just rattle it off quickly? And, uh, and we'll get to, uh, you know, one of my frogs is talking too much, okay? So we'll, I gotta deal with that. I'll deal with that later. How many of you would say, no, no, deal with it today. Deal with it right now, right? Okay, so the other thing that came to mind, again, other things came to mind, but I didn't include them on this list. Denial, something that I'll, we don't think about, and I, I, I think we're in denial about denial. I really, I, I really do. Okay, so the other thing that came to mind was just excuses. Maybe we just, maybe we just have excuses. You know, we have tried and tested excuses. And we see in the scriptures that Gideon, when God called Gideon to do something, to make a move, Gideon said, I am the least in my family. My family's the least in our clan. The clan is the least of, of all the tribes. Gideon said, really, I'm a nobody. I, I can't, I, why call on me? That was, that was his excuse. Interestingly, Moses, we talked about Moses. He lamented, you know what, I'm slow of speech. And, uh, and have a slow tongue. I'm not a, a great communicator, so I'm not your guy. I'm not, I'm not a good public speaker, Moses said. We've never heard that before, right? Um, uh, a fear that certainly people have. Uh, Jeremiah also said that I can't speak for you, Lord. I can't go for you. I can't answer your call because I'm just a young man. They won't listen to me. That I'm, I'm too young. And Sarah, I think interestingly, Abraham's wife, Sarah, said, you know what, God, you can't use me for what you've called me to do. Why? She had an age problem too. But not like Jeremiah, who was too young. She said, God, you can't do this in my life because I am too old. It's, it's, you know, there's always going to be excuses available to us. We could add to those numbers. You know, I can't afford it. It's too difficult. I don't know where to start. I'm afraid of failing, scared, you know, scared to fail. 
um, my parents won't approve of this decision, or I haven't got what it takes to step out and respond and do that thing that I know God wants me to do. Um, and it may be even just this thing, that thing that you know you need to do, right? Someone said it this way, that we convince ourselves that these are reasonable, rational, uh, thought through, and valid. However, when it is God who is doing the calling, our best excuse isn't good enough. Don't believe the lies and don't be tempted to make excuses. God knows you. He knows your desires. He knows your doubts. He sees your weaknesses and he knows your potential. He calls you right where you are, as you are, and promises to guide and shape you. He takes your ordinary life and transforms it with divine calling. I want to encourage you this morning as we reflect and we look about, we look back. Well, we looked back last week. Now we'll look forward. And we're assessing and we're adjusting and, and, and evaluating. I want to encourage you. What frogs? Maybe they're on my list. Um, maybe you have some that I didn't mention. But what areas in your life are holding you back or holding you up or preventing you from God's best in your life? I want to encourage you, deal with that. Make a decision. Do it today. Don't put it off because you know tomorrow very often never comes. Let's, let's go to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, I just pray that this morning is, as we're all uh, here to, to follow you, to serve you, to, uh, to hear your word and, and, and to be drawn closer to you and to be your disciples. Lord God, I pray that you would, by your spirit, lay upon our hearts uh, areas in our lives, those frogs, that, those things that we've needed to, to deal with that, that you've called us to or, or uh, maybe something that, that we, just, we just have known for some time. And maybe even as we speak about denial, maybe we, we haven't, maybe we don't know it because we've been denying it in our lives. But there's this little something there's a spark there's a hint there is i know for me when when i when i recognized that i was susceptible to this like i always knew there was a little tiny sliver of truth that was still calling out to me and i i turned my ears from that still small voice but i pray that you would reveal to us by your spirit those areas and those things that we'll deal with it not at some more convenient time but we'll deal with it today and, uh, and as a result, Lord God, follow you more intimately, more closely, and have your blessing and a, a brand new awakening, an area, uh, a calling, a part of our lives open up to us. Um, Lord God, we thank you for that. We, uh, we invite you to remind us, to help us, to lead us, and to guide us. Lord God, we pray for wisdom this morning that you would help us lead us down uh, the right path. In the awesome and mighty name of Jesus, we ask and pray this this morning. Amen. 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 All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm a pastor sometimes does this where he says, I don't want to show of hands, but, uh, but I'm going to say, do, do I talk too much during, during church yeah. services? <laughs> show, show of hands. I'm not going to look at Jeff, oh. but show of <laughs> No, I just, I feel like uh, there's a lot on my mind. Um, so uh, I'm going to play a song uh, this morning for communion. This is, this is the communion portion of the service. Um, all are invited to take communion. Um, if you are, you don't have to be a member here. Um, you just have to believe that uh, Jesus died and rose for your sins. Um, and uh, we, we ask that you... If you're if you're willing, you take, partake with uh, communion. Uh, but this this song that I'm going to play is uh, is a hymn. Uh, it's not that old, just from around the mid 1700s. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But uh, some of you might know it, some of you might not. It's pretty easy. Uh, but before we sing it, I'd like to you know this uh, New Year. It's New Year's New Year's resolutions. I mine is to get smarter. 
Um, and so with that, let's do a vocabulary lesson. Oh, sweet. Um, to get smarter, but also um, the song, you know, they used, in the 1700s, they used slightly different slang than we do today. I know it's weird to think that back then they used different words, but uh, um, so if we can uh, go over some, some of these words, it might give away the song, it might not, um, but uh, I guess I don't care if it gives away the song. Uh, but it, to, in, in order to fully enjoy the song uh, and rejoice in the Lord, uh, sometimes it's good to know what you're singing instead of just singing random words. Um, this, this first one uh, is more of a sentence to understand, but flaming tongues above. Um, maybe some of you would have been like, that's an easy one, but this refers to angels. Um, we'll go to a tougher one. Ebenezer. Uh, we've all probably heard the word or heard the name, but uh, I've never known what it meant. Um, in 1 Samuel 7.12, it says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So Ebenezer is composed of the Hebrew words Eben and Ezer, shocker, um, which that literally means stone of help. So I didn't know that. Stone of help. Um, Samuel is instructed to make a monument that will remind the Israelites that it is God who has carried them through all their troubles to where they are now. And God wants to continually point his chosen people to his faithfulness. Um, now let's go to uh, the word interposed. Smarter people than me are kind of like, this is the stupidest lesson I've ever heard. But, uh, <laughs> but interposed means to place or insert between. I'll use it in a sentence. I was in, I was in the spelling bee, so okay. can you use that in a sentence, please? Um, Jesus interposed himself, or put himself between us and the wrath of God. Amen. And uh, I'll go to my last one. How about fettered? I've never heard. I thought it was a typo for fettered. <laughs> fettered. This is an old word for chain. In one of these verses, we'll sing, Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. This sentence reminds us that it is God who keeps us from wandering from the blessings he lavishes upon us in Jesus. All right, so that's enough of the plain vocabulary lesson. Um, maybe I'll make it better next time. But uh, let's, let's just sing this together. Um, if you know it, or if you don't, try your best to sing with me. Uh, I'm not one for uh, being a performer, so I would rather everyone sings with me than, than listen to me. Um, but either way, let yourself re reflect on God's love for each and every one of us. Um, the fact that he would send his one and only son to have his body beaten and then shed his blood to allow us to have an eternal connection with him is just incredible. And uh, so, so I ask if you uh, would just join me in this, in this yeah. I'll give this, so. Uh...
uh, uh, Father God, we just uh, reflect again on your love for each and every one, one of us. Um, I didn't say it in my uh, earlier talking, but the prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I say it quite often here in the mornings uh, during worship, but uh, each and every one of us is, is born a sinner and born with that in our, our sinful nature in us to, to wander from you, Lord. And it takes constant reminders of, of church services, of reading the Bible to reflect on, on you, Lord, and to come back come back home to you and, and to, to realize that uh, we are sinful and in need of a Savior, each and every one of us. I guess that we uh, hold up the bread. Uh, Matthew 26 says, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for having your body broken for me, for each one of us living a perfect life for each and every one of us, and rising and defeating death for each and every one of us. Let's take the bread. Let's hold up the cup. As Matthew goes on to say, and he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Thank you, Jesus, for your bloodshed. I can't even comprehend the pain and the agony that it took to, to die on the cross and suffer the sins of all humanity. We thank you, God, for, for sending your Son and your grace that pours over each and every one of us. Let's partake of the cup. Amen. Thank you, guys. Let's, uh, let's have the worship team come up. And uh, we'll close out the service. All right. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> All right, so uh, if you uh, have more than one frog, I know what your frog is. It's a theft frog. You got a little theft frog going on. I want to make sure everybody gets a frog as a reminder. Disgusting little things. If you can't take it, I have cute frogs in my office. I'll, I'll trade you the gross, rubbery frog for a cute little tree frog. It's much more attractive. Um, but we hope that you, uh, you'll grab one, and that'll be a reminder. For nothing else, what a ridiculous sermon that was. Um, but uh, we hope you have a blessed new year. We're off to a great start so far. Um, I don't know if Kenny has anything else to share. I appreciated your comments, Kenny. I don't. I, I don't think he talked too much. Um, but well, you know, I have no. But I have no measurement of what he's talking about. <laughs> Uh, so, how, so how would I know? The, the only thing I have is uh, small group, or life groups, sorry, life yeah. groups. Uh, sign up sheet is out there. If you um, are interested in leading a life group, we are having, uh, though I think the meeting is in a couple weeks, three weeks. Um, if you are interested in doing that, see somebody at the Connect counter to find out what that is, or if you would like to, if you're interested in leading. And we also have uh, new membership classes. Right. Whatever you say. Sure. <laughs> New membership. It's uh, if you're interested yeah, I, in becoming yeah. a member, uh, please see somebody at the Connect counter. Um, we're always wanting to we're wanting to do that more. That's I think that's a New Year's resolution of the church <laughs> right. is to right. um, if new people show up and are interested in becoming members, we don't want to make them wait a full year uh, to become a member. We want uh, we want you guys to feel welcome, feel like members of the church. 
and uh, be able to help out the body of Christ. All right. You are correct. I didn't mean to do the deer in the headlights thing. Huh. Uh, yeah, we got. I think we have a sign out there for that. Um, so, because we've had folks asking, and we just received new members too, but we'll we'll tell you more about them later. But um, they're like, were we approved? What happens? You didn't mention it. We just haven't mentioned it. You're off. After you went through the last one, you're approved. Um, but the only thing I'll just remind you that uh, that we uh, placed offering plates near the exits. And if you remember us in your giving, that would be amazing. We know that the Lord will bless you for that. And uh, I know that many people uh, choose to give online. So that's also an option for you. But we appreciate so much your, uh, your support of Lakeside Family Church. We don't, uh, we, don't charge you mem- we don't charge you membership. We don't charge you <laughs> admission. Uh, somebody years ago compared it to you know, uh, going to the movies. We don't charge you for the movie. If, if we did, we would do it ahead of time. Because then, you know, based on the sermon, you might say, eh, maybe not so much. But you know it's not that kind of a deal. It's supporting this ministry and uh, supporting what God has called this church to do. And this is a really cool church. Come on, somebody, right? Like, I, like it would be weird if I said, this pastor is one of the greatest pastors you're ever going to. That would be weird. I don't know why you're laughing at that. But that would but that'd be, no, that's funny. Um, that would be weird. But I, I will readily, easily, and easily say, this church is awesome. And I'm yes. talking about, I'm talking about all of us. I'm talking about this body. This is, a, this is a great group of people. And this is a great place. So we thank you so much for your support of Lakeside. Um, so we, uh, we thank you and ask God to bless you as you give. All right, let's close with a song. Amen. Mm-hmm.